back everybody to the Wampanoag Perspective Conference. I hope that you have enjoyed uh, the session so far. Uh, it's now my pleasure and absolute privilege to introduce our second keynote um, speaker, Paula Peters. And uh, this is certainly the highlight for me. Uh, a little, little bit about, about Paula. Paula. Um, she's the founder of the Native American, American creative agency Smoke Signals, an independent scholar and a politically, socially and culturally active member of the Washpee Wampanoag tribe. Um, she's a, a writer of Native and particular Wampanoag history and a producer of the travelling exhibit, uh, exhibit Our Story, which is 400 years of Wampanoag history. Um, She's an executive producer of a 2016 documentary film, Mash P9, and author of the companion book that goes with it. Uh, Paula lives with her extended family in Mash P and travels internationally to speak and educate on the true Wampanoag story. She's also formerly a writer at the Cape Cod Times, where she's won numerous national awards for her journalism. And Paula's going to talk today about the romanticised myth of the pilgrim's arrival and and the true cost of colonization from the perspective of indigenous people. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, there's an opportunity for you to put your questions to us um, on the uh, window on the right hand side of your screen and we're going to compile um, those and have a Q&A session afterwards. So um, without further ado, uh, welcome, Paula, and uh, we very much look forward to hearing you talk. Moniki Sak, Natasawis Sonk Wabin, Nutamas Masapiak. I just gave you my introduction in my traditional language, which, which is Wampanaak, and um, my traditional name is Sonk Wabin, and I live in Mashpee. Um, and it's my pleasure to be speaking with all of you today. I wish I could have been there in person, which was the, the original idea. Um, and I'm actually going to speak about um, the, the critical backstory as well as um, uh, colonization. But first I, I wanna share with you a, a little short video. Dude, what are you doing? That's so wrong. You and I need. I wanted to show, but oh, turn my on. Not exactly the one I wanted to show, but still give you a a, a little a little uh, light-hearted way to start. But it's certainly not a light-hearted topic. Um, there is certainly an important backstory to the Mayflower, and for most people who are studying it in this country, it comes. Um, around about third grade in grammar school, people begin to talk about um, the Mayflower, Thanksgiving holiday, and everything begins in the year 1620. Um, and it avoids some really important history where the Wampanoag are concerned. Um, because so much occurred prior to the Mayflower sailing, and so much about uh, the Wampanoag um, the significance of the Wampanoag and the indigenous people was was ignored. Um, I'm going to speak to you uh, partially from things I have already written and partially just things that I, I already know, but in order to introduce the topic of um, the uh, lifestyle and the spirituality of the, the Wampanoag, I want to read from you from a paper that I'd already written. The native lifestyle, while simple, was not unsophisticated in terms of a natural order that placed them within and not on top of the circle of life. Native Americans understood the interplanetary role of the sun and the moon relative to the mother earth in establishing a cycle of seasons for growing, harvesting, hunting, and preparation. 
They were people who managed their presence on earth to be in balance with nature, sustaining themselves without starvation and without starving the living world around them. They hunted and fished with a cunning knowledge of the habits and habitats of the finned, the winged, the four-legged, employing a basic yet sound weaponry, weirs and traps. They harvested wild growing roots, nuts, herbs, and berries while cultivating other foods and the coveted tobacco. Their dome-shaped dwellings clustered in village settings further reflected the simplicity of their lifestyle and were more often than not multi-generational confines, including some that were seasonal to afford access to coastal regions for fishing and planting. In Native American culture, there was a hierarchy of governance and leadership so pragmatic that it eventually became a model for the democracy framed by the post-revolutionary founding fathers of the United States. Native civilizations and humanity were of a much higher intellect than old world interlopers seemed to have for any use for. Colonization was the buzzword of the 17th century among British and European nations racing to stake their claims on a new continent, not unlike the cosmonauts and astronauts of the 1960s scrambling to plant a flag on the moon. For these Europeans experiencing the religious wars of the 16th and 17th centuries, colonizing among indigenous people might have required compromising hard fought religious principles. Recognizing no God among them served a much higher purpose. And as a result, not much effort was made to see one. In fact, they, had they bothered to look for it, native spirit, spirituality was everywhere. It centered on the attributes of the earth and the wonder of other worlds and involved honoring the sun, the moon, and four compass directions, as well as animals and birds. No chapel was necessary. Ceremonies were held wherever and as often as the individually unique while part of the whole community. Birds and animals had spiritual significance, like the crow that delivered the first seed of corn from the Southwest. There were many Thanksgiving opportunities honoring the creator's gifts, like the celebration welcoming the strawberry as the first fruit of the season. Drumming, singing, and dancing had spiritual significance, as, as did ornaments, including shell necklaces and copper pendants, symbolic face paintings and tattoos, embroidered clothing, feathered headdresses. These traditions, are still honored today by the descendants of those people. However, the 17th century New England, in 17th century New England, where efforts were heating up to establish settlements, tolerance for any faith not their own would have been deemed counterproductive, even for those who had ironically come for their own religious freedom. And this is backstory that I'm giving you because so often the indigenous people are portrayed as um, barbaric or savage, um, as if we had um, we had no uh, skills or intelligence. And in fact, the exact opposite was true. Um, as you know, the separatists were planning to leave. Uh, by this time, they had already moved to uh, to Leiden, and they were planning to leave Leiden to come to this new world. And just to give you a little um, uh, piece of the way that they were thinking at the time, um, I want to read to you just a small paragraph from uh, William Bradford's Of Plymouth Plantation. Uh, so they're getting ready to leave and go to this new world. And... Bradford writes that the place they had thoughts on was some of those vast unpeopled countries of America, which are fruitful and fit for habitation, being devoid of all civil inhabitants, where there are only savage and brutish men, which range up and down little otherwise than the wild beasts of the same. So we have these 
contrary uh, differences in, in opinions. Um, the separatists were coming here and they were feeling as though they're just coming to a, a vast unpeopled land and it just wasn't the case. Um, and they actually had more evidence than they, um, than they wanted to pay attention to. Um, there had been explorers that had been coming to this region for a very long time. Um, and they had been wanting to investigate the region for suitability for settlement, uh, but also for trade and for fishing. Um, and round about uh, early, uh, early in the 17th century, there had been um, some uh, mapping of the region by a very famous explorer, John Smith who came and mapped the very area that would ultimately be, be colonized by the uh, pilgrims on the Mayflower. Um, and he came along with another ship, which was captained by a man named Thomas Hunt. Um, along the way, they came upon a village called Patuxet. And when they got to that village of Patuxet, they, um, parted company. John Smith decided that he was going to go on ahead of um, Thomas Hunt and return back to England. And he had left him with instructions to basically um, do some more trading and maybe some more fishing and then come home. But John uh, Thomas Hunt uh, became greedy uh, when he, he saw these many men who came out to trade with him um, and made a, a very tragic decision for the people of Patuxet. Um, he stole 20 men from that region, and those men were taken captive and brought to uh, Spain to be sold into slavery. He also, on that same trip, stopped at another village, another Wampanoag village, the village of Nasset, uh, where he took seven men. So a total of 27 men were taken and um, brought to Malaga in Spain. Um, some of them were actually sold into slavery. Uh, some were rescued by a, um, a group of friars who, who came and, and protested the sale of these men in slavery. Um, and um, it was just a, a really tragic time. And this is something that, that gets written about a lot in history, but doesn't get spoken about. Um, it is that, that tragic backstory to the Mayflower. Um, and uh, we, at, as Native people, remember this time, of course, with a great deal of sadness um, that, that our people were um, devastated, of course, by this. And as Smoke Signals was charged with uh, creating an exhibit some years back that uh, would tell our story in our voice. One of the things that, that we thought was really important to do was to put some uh, flesh on the bones of those uh, people who endured that indignity of, of the slavery, who, who endured and, and um, tragically had been left behind without any um, hope of ever recovering their loved ones. And um, it was really quite easy for us to do because all you had to really do was to imagine suddenly being um, left without your loved ones or having your loved ones taken from you without any idea of what had happened to them. Um, anyway, I want to share with you one of the videos that we created for our exhibit, Our Story, um, that helps us to tell that part of this story. Wonderful piece that was um, performed by uh, a young mother in our community, and all we asked her to do was imagine what it would have been like to have lost her own husband and the father to her children. She just did a phenomenal job of um, putting a face to that to that woman of the 17th century, and these kinds of efforts are really important because. Um, in the 17th century, while we had a very sophisticated uh, society, we didn't have um, the, the skills to 
write down our own history or advocates really to write our own history. But it really doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to imagine the pain that that woman would have had uh, endured. Um, so of those uh, 27 men that were, were taken away, um, there's only one that we know of who ever was able to return. Um, and that one man ultimately ends up living, he lives in England for a while. And um, he lives as a, as a houseboy for uh, a, uh, an English, um, wealthy English gentleman. Um, but at some point he, he will, he does em, implore to his, uh, his people that he would like to get back home again. Um, but before that happens, uh, and just after the, the horrible, uh, kidnappings that occurred in, in Patuxet and Nauset, um, more interactions with the, uh, the, explorers and fishermen uh, from afar actually brings another disaster to the Wampanoag and the people of the coastal regions of New England. Um, there was, a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there was a ship that came and brought some men that were not well. And um, that sickness uh, began to invade the communities of indigenous people very, very quickly. Not unlike the pandemic that we're enduring today, because these were people who in this part of the world, there had been no communicable diseases at all. So something as simple as the common cold could have uh, caused real devastation. And whatever this, this illness was, which we were never able to um, 100% determine, but something like a smallpox or, um, or, or a flu became very, very deadly and it became deadly very quickly. Part of the reason um, historians believe that that occurred was because of the tradition of the um, indigenous people and, and particularly of the Wampanoag was that when someone in your community became sick, um, part of the healing of that was to gather around that person and um, to sing songs and to bring, um, you know, to bring food and, and to uh, pray over this person. Uh, so the spread of whatever this pandemic was spread very quickly and killed tens of thousands of people. So while Squanto was trying to convince his captor, John Slaney, to send him back, um, little known to, to himself, um, his people were dying. Ultimately, uh, Squanto does uh, come back uh, with a, uh, as, as a guide to uh, Thomas Dermer. And when uh, he returns, he returns to find Patuxet is completely wiped out. Um, either everyone has died or those who may have survived had fled to a safer region. Um, so he ends up being really a man without a country. Um, he returned with a man, Thomas Dermer, who was um, known among the Wampanoag community as someone who was an agent of Sir Ferdinando Gorgias. And that man had, had financed um, the taking of slaves from native communities. So uh, unbeknownst to, to him, he had come with someone who, who was an enemy. Uh, that put uh, Squanto in a very uh, precarious position. Um, and so after uh, Dermer had uh, left, Squanto uh, lived among the Wampanoag, lived under the watchful eye of the Massasoit Usamequin. And I think that they probably weren't sure what they were going to do with Squanto because they didn't fully trust him. Um, and uh, he was, uh, had no, no allies really. Um, he, he certainly was a man without a country. And 
I'm not sure how it is in England, but here in this country, when um, when you think about or when the story of uh, colonization is taught in schools, um, there are very few names that are uh, are common in uh, especially Wampanoag names that are common in the story. And Squanto is is prominent um, as the friendly native who helped the the pilgrims to survive um, because, in fact, he did. Um, and about a year after his return, the Mayflower does arrive in, um, in the region and they ultimately end up finding safe harbor in a place that is actually on John Smith's map. It's a place that John Smith calls Plymouth. Uh, however, um, it is also the place that is known as Patuxet. And that is the critical backstory that I want you to, to really make a connection to is that Patuxet is the place that Squanto was taken from, is that Patuxet is the place where so many people died and um, suffered uh, from, from the plague. And Patuxet is the place that Squanto came back to and found that he had no one. Um, and then he is essentially the last survivor of, of that uh, region. And, you know, I'd like to, I wonder sometimes what it was like uh, when he first encountered uh, the pilgrims from the Mayflower and after they realized that these people were actually going to stay, um, did he understand that um, they were going to be uh, that they were going to be living in essentially what was his village. But I imagine it is a place that, that he probably did not want to stay uh, because of the, the uh, significance of that being the place where all of his relatives perished. Um, another thing that isn't often told and as the story of the pilgrims is, is uh, carried on is that um, when they arrived in, in Plymouth and um, Patuxet and called it Plymouth, the, uh, the plague was a very uh, obvious, um, had a very obvious impact on that region. They actually had to sweep away the bones of the dead in order to build their, um, their temporary homes and then ultimately their permanent homes. So it was something that's probably written in the margins here and there. Actually, um, William Bradford does write about it um, to some degree in, in his writings. And um, it's, it's kind of overlooked, but what a dramatic thing to have, have happened to you. Would, you. would you come to a place and then build your, your homes on the, on the graves of the people that had lived there before you? Um, which is just another, um, uh, another bit of evidence of how little they thought of the indigenous people. Um, oh, we're going to share Bradford now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to share another video with you. Dear pilgrims, as we Of course, it would have been really nice if we could have communicated that message 400 years ago. Um, it really comes from, uh, from and uh, I thank Talia for, for reading, reading that letter for us. It was a, a part of a project that um, uh, some folks in the UK had asked us to participate in. Um, of course, things worked out a little bit differently for us, a lot differently for us. Soon after they established their colony in Plymouth, um, there was an initial meeting with uh, some Wampanoag people, but that didn't happen actually until the spring of 1621. Um, and in fact, Squanto did play a, a, a big role in um, introducing the Wampanoag leader, Usamequin, 
to the leaders of the Plymouth Colony and um, helping to negotiate a treaty, um, a treaty that would have made them allies to one another. Um, at the time, the Usumikwin, uh, Usumikwin, who was the Massasoit, had a great deal to consider. Uh, he had to consider that oftentimes when these ships came from uh, across the sea and brought men uh, who would sometimes do harm to his people um, and sometimes bring sickness to his people. Uh, but this ship was different because this ship brought men and women and children. Um, and he knew that they had come to stay. He also knew that uh, there were threats to his, uh, his territory because so many had been perished from, from the plague that um, the other native communities, particularly the Narragansett to the south, uh, were encroaching upon the Wampanoag territories. And in order to stay strong, um, he would benefit from having allies. Um, the treaty was signed in the spring of 1621, and it was a treaty that I'm sure Usamequin had no idea would impact as negatively the sovereignty of his people as it did. Uh, part of the treaty actually implies that, um, that these people would come and bring the rule of the crown. Ironically, they brought with them the very same rule that they were fleeing and imposed that over the next 50 years, they would impose that laws, the, the rules and the laws of the crown upon the people who had welcomed them in a way that, that really made it uh, very, very difficult for the Wampanoag to survive in their own territory. Um, I'd like to open up this part of the discussion to questions. Um, and for those of you who are, um, who have questions about what I've had to say or uh, other uh, things about the Wampanoag people, I'd be happy to, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, Steven, I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure how I go about taking questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Paula, for that. Uh, those wonderful words. I, I'm just going to echo what Scott said, um, and you don't really need to add anything more than that. Beautiful, touching the truth. I think so inspiring, so incredibly moving. And I know um, you, you and um, Stephen gave us the narrative for the uh, interpretation panels at Pilgrim's Gallery, but it's so much more um, meaningful when, when we hear it through your own voice. Um, I'm going to hand over in a second to Tim, my colleague, who's going to facilitate the questions and answers. Uh, if I can start off, though, with one question, um, certainly for visitors to the Pilgrim's Gallery, uh, the most the most asked questions were about Squanto. I mean, everybody is just enthralled by that story. But I always like to point out as well that um, within the um, narrative on the panels, it talks about the Wampanoag women um, being able to, or, or were, uh, the, peop the um, people that inherited land and possessions. And it puts into perspective that um, in the early 17th century, the UK thought that they were the civilised people. And yet the, the Wampanoag people recognised that women were important and um, had a right to inherit. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, you know we are to be a matriarchal uh, society and um, women were um, landowners pri you know primarily the landowners and women um, could uh, uh, then to become uh, leaders to become sachems and chiefs um, and were very much uh, considered equal to men um, 
it's a um, it was something that that was very challenging for the colonists because they when they initially had to um, make dealings with um, their their tribal neighbors and and would have to in some cases deal with women leaders it, it, it boggled their minds they they really didn't understand how that could be because of course their women had played a much more subservient role. Um, Thank you. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Tim now, who's just been making a note of some of the questions and comments for you. Thank you very much, Peter. Hello, Paula. Very nice to meet you. Um, I've met her before. I love the presentation, so thank you so much. And hi again, Hartman. Nice to see you. Um, I, it's Hartman there. Is he going to be joining for some of the questions? Um, yep, back. Hi, Hartman. Um, I will just go through the list. I've got a couple of questions myself, but I'll pick out some things that are comments and maybe see if I can spin them into sort of questions for you, Paula, if I, if I can. A question from Viola, which is about remembering that um, in order for the pilgrims to plant their extreme Puritan agenda onto the shores of Massachusetts, that all dissenters had to be silenced and the Wampanoag people uh, had not only to be silenced, but needed to be demonized in order to justify their actions. Uh, any thoughts or comments on that comment? <laughs> um, well, I mean, that that was pretty much the, the way that it happened. Um, Hartman, did you want to chime in there? Is he still with us? Sure, I'm happy to chime in where I can. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I def that's definitely the case. Uh, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, with, with that really rigid totalitarian idea that there is such a one narrow way to live, the idea that you have a, 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 a viable alternative imaginable out there is is a very is a threat to the very nature of that. So, of course, all anything else that viably could work had to be eliminated, removed, or as, as they sought to remove themselves from a, a world that uh, that they couldn't tolerate being around for the success of, of different and other viewpoints uh, influencing their kids. Um, and, and and our world here was no different. It just had the uh, the blessing of of the uh, of the society of, of Europe to go in dominate and displace and subjugate non-christian peoples of the western hemisphere and and africa and and other parts of the world is through the doctrine of discovery uh that that made it acceptable to subjugate any non-christian people and to take from them in, in any way that you might imagine and all authorized by the pope even though the mayflower passengers were no fan of the pope um this this idealism of of Christian superiority spilled out, of course, uh, you know, over and over again. Uh, you know, I, to, I was I was hoping to jump in and echo on some of the things that Paul was saying about uh, our matriarchal systems as well. Uh, yeah, the matriarchal systems were such a such a problem. I know that later on they have a war known as King Philip's War, uh, fought with the descendants of Usamequin, um, but uh, largely this war was was uh fought with two main leaders it was uh philip uh, medicom as his, as his wampanoag name is and his his uh his older sister-in-law weedamu and the land in taunton that we are still having disputes over today uh was land that was held by weedamu and the English attempted to buy that land from her husband, from her brother, and from her sons. All these men in her family, that they attempted to buy the land because they couldn't get past the idea that she was a woman who had the right to buy and sell land. And this this eventually led to a war, a very violent and bloody war. The fact that that again and again that she wouldn't relinquish her right to be the only pe person. Uh, who had any right to to sell or or to you know transfer the holdings of that land because she was the only title holder, uh, and this was so far beyond the uh, the imagination of 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 the uh, the English colonists at the time that this actually led to a, a full blown war where the English were almost driven out of out of the, uh, New England, uh, near very nearly so. Mm. 
Thank you. Um, your question come from Kathy then. Um, why do you think the truth has never been told and how can that be changed? There's a, there's a big question for you. Yeah. Well, the truth is, is, is definitely been there all along. Um, the, the Wampanoag story, the Wampanoag truth is something that has been marginalized um, or ignored for the last 400 years. But it's not been difficult for us to uh, delve into these writings, even though we didn't have things written by our own hand. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's, it's not uh, difficult to read what has is, is been um, sometimes shamelessly journaled by the explorers who came here, who, who are saying, uh, there's there's one explorer's journal that um, I every time I read it I, I I'm just uh, just blown away by how um, plainly they write about having to grab the the natives they were so naked it said they were so naked and their skin was slippery and the reason their skin was slippery is because they warmed themselves you know in cooler weather they they would put um, bear oil or whale oil grease on their bodies that's what kept them warm. And they were trying to kidnap these men and they had to grab them by the hair on their heads. And just reading something like that and knowing that we're talking about human beings, um, you know, you, you just need to put on your human being hat um, and interpret that um, for what it really is. And um, yeah, there's, there's been uh, uh, hundreds of years of our story being um, ignored or marginalized. And I think that one of the uh, silver linings to this 400th anniversary is that we discovered that people really want to know the truth. People really want to know the whole story. And um, at first, I thought when we began to put together exhibits and, and um, you know, tell uh, stories about this and, and, and write about this, that we would get a lot of pushback when in fact it has been the exact opposite. The people are hungry for this, this kind of, of knowledge. I just wondered if you wanted to add anything to that. Is it, is it about listening? It's taken 400 years for people to actually listen. The story sounds like it's always been there, but nobody's been willing to, to listen perhaps. Well, certainly there's uh, the story has always been there. You know, the truth, the truth exists on its own, whether people speak it or not. Uh, the truth is, you know, it's 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 uh, it exists free of 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 our our, uh, you know, our willingness to look at it. Um, you know, so this is, you know, this is one of the things about the truth as opposed to, to lies and fabrication It's part of why the truth can always be questioned uh you know because it's it's there's a sol uh, a a solid reality about it um yeah but you know we uh we have seen periods of time where and, and across different spectrums of of society where the truth makes pe some people uncomfortable especially if people who are in power and uh and like to maintain the status quo of how the system at hand works and sometimes the truth can erode the faith in that system and our faith in our our uh, belief in these systems of of power and structures of power are the most important things that empower them uh so our power within ourselves uh, is something that we freely give away if we don't understand the truth and when we do understand the truth and we have that power in ourselves and we understand that power in ourselves we're able to 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 change the world where not just so few that uh that are able to benefit themselves uh with so little um are able to continue to have a society that functions that way uh and this is this is the case with wampanoag people because we have the the true first title to the land uh that that sprouted forth the rest of the united states and that that truth of that injustice of stealing of land and di violently dispossessing people of land you know, cast an ugly shadow on this idea of America as the leader of the free world, when in fact it's based on the theft of land and theft of labor, uh, and, and the two are in contradiction. So, um, 
you know, people don't want to look at that if they want to maintain that structure of power. But a lot of people are not invested in that and want to hear that truth and are willing to hear that truth because it makes sense of the world around them in a way that the lies don't. Uh, and it makes sense the way things are in a way that, that can't be denied. Uh, so they want to hear it because it, it makes the rest of the world fall into place. Mm. It's making me think... Um people think this was a Gandhi quote, but I think it's actually some American industrialist 100 years ago. First, they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they fight you, then you win. You know, <laughs> might be a different order for yourself over 14 years, but it sounds like it's working towards the same the same outcome. So and then they write one. and then they write about you and act like they agreed with you all along. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, uh, the the American chap who actually coined the phrase, the last one is, and then they build statues to you. So that's that's very apt. Um, question from Marcia. Um, I'm from Mashapi and wonder if you can talk about the initiatives to revive the Wampanoag language. We're so proud of your efforts. Oh, well, um, welcome from Mashpee. Um, Hartman can probably tell a bit about this as well, but we have been recovering our, our language, uh, the Wampanoag language that um, I did uh, introduce myself. I'm not a fluent speaker, but it's been a wonderful uh, effort by the community and it is something that pulls us together beautifully um, because it, uh, it is something that, that you know, we can really call our own. Um, Hartman, I know you've, you've had a great experience with the language as well, so I'll let you answer some of that. Yeah, I, I've, I've, really uh, been blessed to, to fall into learning so much about the language. Uh, you know, I spent 10 years in our language program. Um, I first started the classes thinking I'd learn how to say a few things, you know, and that was it. And yet found how much amazing historical and cultural information is embedded in a language. Uh, the language was nearly lost nearly extinct so it took a lot of work to revitalize but fortunately as wampanoag people we you know were the the first uh literate people of of the americas some of the first literate people of the americas when the english got here that religious intolerance uh had another a benefit that came along underneath it uh they wanted to teach us to read and write so we could learn the scripture of the bible and those tools of reading and writing were very quickly adapted. And next thing you know, Indians were teaching each other. They had never met European people. So by 1640, there are more Wampanoag people, monolingual, in Wampanoag. So they only speak Wampanoag, literate. So speaking, reading, writing in Wampanoag. There are more people speaking, reading, writing Wampanoag in New England there are, than there are English people literate in English in New England. So very quickly, we saw the value of these tools and started spreading them around. And we started making wills. We started making, uh, we started writing letters of complaint, personal correspondence, and deeds. And once we started writing down deeds, this is when they started to create laws against us using our language and started trying to eliminate us using our language as well. Uh, you know, so this is uh, this has been a big effort. We have the whole Bible and we have all these correspondences and letters and such to build this language on. But it took a huge amount of work, largely by Jesse Littledoe and Natana Hicks, who you saw as the, the young mother in the film, has been a big part of our language program. Um, you know, there's been uh, uh, Tobias Vanderhoop, Woody uh, Vanderhoop and. Uh, um, why am I spacing out? Oh, Tracy Kelly as well. They've all been really big parts of, of revitalizing this language, but really spearheaded by Jesse Little, though. And uh, it's one of the most amazing uh, efforts of language reclamation seen in the world at this point, uh, next, to, next to Hebrew. So the, the efforts that have been put into revitalizing this language are huge and, 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 and have a huge pride, sense of pride for Wampanoag people but also really a, a source of, of uh, cultural knowledge that's allowed for so many great things to come out of that, just this understanding that comes from that cultural knowledge that's embedded in how you speak. Right. Yeah, brilliant. Thank, thanks, guys. Um, a comment, um, which I th thought it might be nice to flag up from Eleanor. Um, Eleanor's from Rotherhi Rotherhithe, I think that's right, in London. 
the home of the Mayflower and run a world music series. Um, and she's provided a little link there. I wonder whether we ought to be sort of getting some music to reflect your sort of history and your culture as well. So that might be something that uh, somebody at our team can sort of capture and, and reach out to you. Um, but a question from David Widener, um, Dr. David Widener, sorry. Um, great presentation. What are your thoughts on about how we can continue this work beyond today? And are there any strategies you might suggest for our audience? to pick that up and take it forward? Well, sure. I mean, that question comes from um, someone who is a true champion of um, our story to begin with, because David, um, of course, is at the Provincetown Monument Museum, and they've done a phenomenal job of um, creating an exhibit. The exhibit um, actually repurposes some of the uh, materials that were in the Our Story exhibit that um, we made and circulated around this region for the last decade. And it gives a permanent home to our story. Um, and I think that the more that we can um, uh, bring this story into educational settings, uh, whether it be uh, the third grade classrooms that, you know, typically get the whitewashed story of the Mayflower arriving and Squanto being their best buddy and, um, excuse me, dog. <laughs> um, but uh, either that, uh, as well as um, these, these um, college level courses that um, are now uh, focusing more on a more balanced story. Um, and, and asking the obvious, obvious questions. Um, so uh, there's, there's a lot we can do going forward from an educational um, perspective. Um, what would you add to that, Hartman? I think that, you know, just being, sharing the story, sharing what you know, presenting the other side, giving space to the other side. If you're in a position where you're at a, uh, you know, institution of learning or education and museum, uh, you know, school or whatever all else that uh, inviting the voices of the people into to tell our own story and share it. Uh, we have expertise and we have personal, uh, you know, a, a passion for these things. That this is this is a story that's, you know, it, it's it's personal to us. And so we can share it in a way that that uh, that the people can walk away and, and remember because, mm -hmm. you know, these these things are not simply just a matter of the facts. They are the facts, but there's there's a human emotion, a human element that, that is important as well. And so I think to, to allow Native people to share our own stories is, is important to what the, the people that we're sharing with uh, are able to carry away and take away with it. It's, you know, when you hear somebody talking about a b and c person you know three times removed it's a really different thing than when you hear about somebody who's talking about something that's that's personal to them that's impacted their life uh so it's it's a really important thing to to allow us as native people to to share these uh these stories as well um you know uh we are we are seeing here in the states uh, a real pushback against teaching factual actual history under the guise of of uh the right wing pushing against something that they call critical race theory uh but critical race theory as i was talking in the in the breakout session earlier is is um is really a, a college level you know uh teaching and and they they're using this fear fear mongering of of uh critical race theory which is obviously something that there is a lack of understanding of uh to to force you know, uh, uh, in line curriculum, even down to kindergarten. Uh, so we need to work against that and see that for what that is um, and, and and struggle against that here in the United States, be allowed to teach the actual facts of history, even if they make some people uncomfortable. Uh, and that's, that's the truth about history. If you're not being confronted with something uncomfortable, then you're not really, really learning true history. You're learning propaganda. So less propaganda, more fact. Absolutely. Absolutely. Story it is. I mean, personally, the takeaway for me is that, uh, as I think I touched on with Stephen earlier, one thing that we were keen to do is sort of connect 
the Nash P people, um, Wampanoag people, with our youth council, because our youth council are our future. There are representatives in Bassett Law, and so to tie in those guys up with maybe you guys, some some of your younger representatives, and and keep that dialogue going, so it goes on to the next generation. So I'm certainly a big advocate of that, and will support sure. support that. Programs just, like that are amazingly fruitful and just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm all for something like that. Those types of exchanges really, you know, build into amazing things and and things that you don't necessarily see in a couple of years, but you know, mm -hmm. you see expanded out over decades. I'm just hankering after a trip over there, you see. So I'm thinking if I push that, I might be able to facilitate that on uh, expenses. <laughs> um, a comment from Sam, which comes back to one of the points earlier, actually, um, about it. I think it's just over 100 years, isn't it, since we got uh, the vote for women in the United Kingdom. So uh, it's still quite current history for us, um, going back to giving women equal equal rights. Um, there was one more comment. I think I just wanted to pick up. Um, where is it? How many years um, is the United States into allowing women to vote? Um, it was 1922, so it, it's been about 100 years. Yeah. And you've got an offer, I think, about uh, the one pornography music side of things. So we'll we'll correct those links for you. Um, where was it? I saw another question somewhere. I can't find it now. Um, oh, somebody backing up the uh, the point about sort of taking it forward and making sure it sort of carries on. So back it backing it up. Just if there's any more questions to come in, can I throw one of mine in? Actually. Um, and it was something I can't remember if it was yourself, Hartman or Stephen mentioned when you were over with us. Um, and we were talking about this this concept about enoughness. And when I was listening to the third video, I wrote a couple of things down about we are the land and there's enough land to share. And I thought how pertinent that is now and currently. Um, and I was thinking I read I read something only yesterday, which it said if everyone had nothing, everyone would be happier than if everybody had everything right. uh, and and i think um it came across at the beginning of your talk paula about how you know the one Pernod people are stewardships of the land and live in harmony with the land um is that still true today um and do you still try to try to do that and we've we got something we can learn from you there well i think certainly we do um you know and one of the most heartbreaking things for us to, to see is, uh, um, you know, when uh, the, the earth is, is abused. I mean, we, we were solidly advocates um, for uh, our uh, brothers and sisters out, out west when, when the uh, pipeline protests were, were going on. And, you know, and, and um, uh, here in our own backyard, the, there's just this, uh, the overdevelopment of, what is our own uh, reservation land, uh, land that had been promised to us forever, uh, is now uh, strip malls and, and uh, tract homes and, and uh, overdeveloped with, with uh, especially on, along the coastal region, um, the, the uh, mansions and, and big boats and, and things like that, that that are just reflections of people's wealth in this region have actually caused our, our land to suffer and our, our uh, waterways to suffer. Um, there's, in particular, uh, there's uh, a bay that I, I live very nearby, Shoestring Bay. And I can remember as a child being able to um, paddle on that bay with my, my dad and my brothers. And uh, you know, they, they would be fishing for, for crabs in the, in the water. And, even though we were sitting on top of the water, I could see the bottom and I could see, you know, there's the crabs. I, I was the younger sister. So they'd perch me at the front of the boat to tell them where the crabs were. These days, if I'm in that same water and I put my hand in the water from the boat, I can't even see my fingertips. It's also polluted with the eutrophication and um, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible to, to, to see the abuses of the earth and the, you know, uh, Obviously, there's there's uh, climate change that people want to ignore, and you know we are certainly uh, advocates for that kind of truth. It's not just about telling our true history; it's like telling our true our true future. And I know Hartman has stuff to say about this, so I'm going to let him go too. I think that you know culturally, our community there's a value system of of valuing 
the the natural world around us and and we're diverse people and we have tribal members that are considered good citizens in our tribe and tribal citizens that you know are of course you know just like any community that they don't uh that don't fall in line with the expectations, but there is a sense of what community expects and, and people who treat the environment badly are not uh, considered good citizens of our people. You know, this is something that our society and our community will put, put uh, the shame on you for if you're doing things that are not helpful to the earth and uh, into our land. Um, the development around Mashpee is so terribly overdone. And yeah, it's like, you know, talking about, you know, these waterways and these these houses and these golf courses, they're just dumping, you know, the, the fertilizer into the water and we're seeing algae blooms. We, you know, the, the pond was closed for swimming this, this past summertime and it was the first time that I know of it happening. Um, you know, and and it used to be some of the the cleanest water on all of Cape Cod, um, you know. But these uh, these houses and these golf courses and and these these uh, you know these symbols of wealth and affluence are oftentimes things that are you know not even occupied and used for more than half the year. There are some things that are that are kept up for for the very wealthy to be able to to spend a couple of weeks for their vacation in Cape Cod and have the bright green lawns and have their boat and have, you know, they unwrap for that one trip out a year. And yet the people who've been here and lived here for 12, 13, 15,000 years have to suffer being able to use and access our pond, which we love and care about and water is a part of us and we are a part of it, you know, that we, that we share a ceremony with that we interact with in a way that values these as our living relatives, the fish, the, the, the hawks, the eagles, the deer, uh, the trees themselves. Uh, this is what we're taught to understand, that these are our relatives and our neighbors and a part of our community just as much as our, our, our human cousins. Um, you know, and when this is what's taught to you to to see in the value of the world, how painful it is to see these things destroyed, cut down, uh, you know, run amok. Um, you know, these traditions like going clamming, which is, you know, a valuable tradition to me. Not only do I like to go to the water and get clams and eat the clams and feed my body with them, I also made jewelry from the shell. And, you know, the places that my grandfather taught me to go and shellfish, are things that you go down to the water now and you see that the sign says no shell fishing because the water is polluted. Uh, these are, it's not just a matter of the resource itself. It's a matter of the traditions of how we go and gather the stories that are told with it, the way that we learn to, to value and love and, and care for the land. These things are all impacted by, by, uh, by this overdevelopment and you know this this matter of resource extraction uh this matter of uh taking what you want is is central to colonization and what that colonial effort is and it's something that we see is present you know then and it's still present today whether it's a housing developer or a oil pipeline or a, a copper mine or a gold mine as we you know i've i've uh yeah, and I've I've seen this happen in indigenous indigenous communities throughout the the Americas. Uh, you know, we own and we are in control of less than five percent of the world's surface, and yet have eighty percent of the biodiversity. Um, you know, the, there's a reason for that. It's because we care for these things like our relatives, and now that's they're seeking to extract those things for the the benefit of the few, the benefit of the capital market again. But, what Seattle say? You can't eat money. Yeah. <laughs> only, when last, only when the last fish is dead and the last tree is cut, you'll discover that you can't eat money. So yeah. you might be getting there soon. Here, here, here. Um, that enoughness message was a real big takeaway from me. You know, you don't need another bedroom in your house. You don't need another car. You don't need more watches or more things. You know, at some point you've got to say, I've got enough. I'm all right. I'm happy. So uh, that, was, that was something. Um, I'm conscious about time and, and we really are running over a little bit, but I'm 
kind of want to try and clear off the last few questions if I may. So one very quick one and then maybe one longer one if I could. Uh, first, uh, first quicker one from Jeanette, um, as a parent of an eight year old in the US, totally agree with everything you're saying. Um, Paula and Hartman, do you have any speaking programs that schools can request um, to bring the true Wampanoag story to the people in America? Sure. Um, and I would say it depends on where you are, but now everybody is everywhere with this Zoom stuff. So um, it really doesn't depend on where you are. I used to, back in the day, um, and Hartman uh, did this as well, we, uh, we did education outreach programs to the local schools. So uh, we saw um, the impact of being able to share you know, the, the whole story with our, our local school children. And now that's, that's become uh, much broader. Um, and I'm sure, uh, well, I know that we do that here at Smoke Signals. We arrange for um, speakers to either physically go and, and be with a group or a classroom, um, or we can also arrange for there to be Zoom uh, meetings with classrooms and uh, with teachers from, eighth grade, from eight, eight year olds to, to uh, we've actually done uh, educational seminars with um, uh, school teachers in the summertime. We have groups of school teachers that will come and, and do educational seminars. Um, so yeah, you know, plug for my own company there, but uh, contact Smoke Signals, let us know, um, you know what, what you need um, and we will find it for you. Um, and I know Hartman is someone who, who has done a number of those programs. I'm, uh, I can still do them as well, but I, I'm a little bit lazier than that. But Hartman, um, you've been doing these programs for a while. What can you? Uh, how can you answer this this question? Yeah, certainly. Uh, yeah, I got to yeah this past uh, past summer go down to Virginia for a, a Teachers Institute teaching difficult history. So that's that's part of the things that uh, I've participated in is is doing training for teachers, and then that you know disseminates further, but I also done in-person classroom visits or Zoom classroom visits. Uh, after our visit to to uh, Bassett Law Museum, uh, I got to uh, be included into a, a Zoom uh, a Zoom classroom presentation for a year or two in, in, uh, in the classroom over there in England. So, um, you know, that was a uh, that was something I did, but you know, uh, yeah, I'm I'm happy to to show up at classrooms and do presentations, bring stuff for kids to touch and feel, and and mm -hmm. holding their hands if that's possible, and that's always something that kids carry away well. But you know, it's it's also the the reality of the world we're living in right now. Uh, Zoom is sometimes the safer option, but it's also sometimes just the more realistic option. I wouldn't have been able to to make a quick yeah, you know, weekday trip over to England to do that that sec that uh grade two or year two or how are you, I forget how you guys call it. You think it's year two or level two or whatever it is yeah, in England. Yeah. 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 So I you know that wouldn't have been possible without Zoom and, and it's it's I nice to be able to do that as well. I do still have a, a, a ticket that well, I have there's to... Amelia talking about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna say something there. Oh, I, I do still have a, a ticket to the UK that I've got to use before the year is out. Uh, uh, one of my trips that I had planned um, right after uh, COVID began, of course, was canceled. And uh, the airlines is now hammering me to use the ticket or lose it. I don't know. <laughs> Lovely. Well, I'm sure we'd welcome you over back in Bassett Law anytime, Paula. Okay. Just uh, to put Isabel uh, and Sandra on notice, this is the last one so they can come in uh, and, and wind up. Um, I've saved this for last because reading into it a bit, it might be a bit political, but hey, let's let's go controversial for the last one. Eh? And this is from this is from Marcia and Dr. Widener um, joined together. So um, can we bring up the challenge of the Wampanoag sovereignty? Uh, and the current situation that you're in. And uh, David Wine is backing that up, saying the audience should be told about the tribal lands. So I'm not sure exactly what that means, but if you could pick that up to wind us up, please, that'd be fabulous. I know, I know exactly what uh, David is talking about. And <laughs> um, we have struggled for 400 years to, to remain in our ancestral homelands. And round about um, in the, in the uh, 1970s, 
it became clear to uh, the Wampanoag people who were still living here in Mashpee that um, our tribal rights were being infringed upon, our tribal lands were being were disappearing at an alarming rate. And so make a long story short, because this could be a very long answer, but I'm going to make it a short answer. Um, uh, the Wampanoag people sued for the return of our ancestral lands and as such uh, launched the process of um, uh, federal acknowledgement in this country because prior to our, our suing for the return of our lands in the 1970s, there was no process for federal acknowledgement of Indian tribes. And uh, that came about and the whole process developed as they tried to deny our um, acknowledgement of our tribe for over 30 years. Um, so tribal sovereignty for us is incredibly hard fought. Um, my father was among those leaders who petitioned for the acknowledgement back in 1974, and he died waiting for the government to say, yes, you are here. Um, by 2007, it earn our federal acknowledgement, but it came in such a period of our internal political turmoil that we were not able to continue the, the um, right, rightful uh, purpose for even getting this federal acknowledgement was so that we could sue for our lands, uh, the return of the open space in Mashpee, which would have been, there were uh, many, many people in the community who were not native, who agreed with uh, the tribe having these lands returned to them because they felt like we would have been much better stewards of the land. But in the 30 years that we spent waiting for our acknowledgement, um, so many of the developers who fought, of course, fought our right to have our lands returned to us, they developed those lands. And that's why Shoestring Bay is, is black instead of clear. Um, and it's, uh, it's a right that we have to continue to fight for. Um, as uh, Hartman mentioned, and I'll let him uh, speak more about the, the lands in Taunton, um, uh, which are also our, our ancestral homelands. We've had to fight for the rights to, to keep that as part of our reservation because there's, there's just those who politically have different ideas. Um, uh, but yeah, Hartman, uh, I'll let you jump in because I know we're running out of time. And, you know, the, the effort of federal recognition has been huge for us and it's been something that's necessary and it's been something that it's also a matter of working with what you have to work with, sadly, because the whole reason why we have to deal with an acknowledgement process from the federal government is the fact that there is a lack of acknowledgement of that we are the original title holders of the land, that we are a people and that we have right to own the land under our feet. And that's been a problem that we've been having to fight against for 400 years. Since the arrival of the Mayflower, since before the arrival of the Mayflower, when the king in England wrote out a charter that gave the land that belonged to us to some of his subjects. And we were nowhere involved in that. In any place, anywhere else, in any other circumstance, the idea that that I get to sell something that doesn't belong to me or I get to give away something that doesn't belong to me is a problem. And this is this underlying injustice is something that's been allowed to continue here in the United States uh, because uh, the, the way that Indian people are seen is not being fully human uh, and that we don't have the full capacity of human rights to, to actually own the land under our feet. Uh, so this process of federal recognition and federal acknowledgement is, is really the best thing that we have to work with, but it's a process that, that is, is such a, a problematic thing in and of itself that we have to, to prove our existence as a tribe, to our existence as a people, to people who come here from other places and found us here. Uh, it's an outrageous injustice that this is this is a standard of proof. This is a process that we have to even go through to be able to own our homeland, uh, to be able to to belong to our homeland, really, 
uh, we are Mashpee people, and we take our name from the fact that we are the people who've always been next to the Mashpee Pond and next to the Mashpee River. Those pieces of land, that body of water, defines us as who we are, and we are defined because that's where we come from. And and that we have to lay out uh, 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 however many th- five thousand pages of documentation to prove to strangers who've come from someplace else that we are who we are when we are in the place that we are right now, that we exist where our shoe prints fit into the ground is is an outrageous injustice. Um, But it's an injustice that we fought and we continue to fight and they're having to still continue to fight as we see another appeal being filed from people who don't want us to be able to to have the land that we've always had, that we've always existed in because they covet it and they want desire to have it for themselves. And we don't want to give it up. Absolutely. So thank you very much, both. A great point to finish the uh, the questions and answers on. Um, so on my behalf, before I hand over to the others, thank you very much. Uh, Paula, great to meet you. Hartman, I hope it's not 400 days, 400 months, 400 years before we can have another pint together in a pub somewhere. So uh, hopefully hope we'll, we'll, well. We'll, we'll see yeah. each other again soon. So I'll hand over to Isabel and Sandra to wrap up. Thank you, everybody. Hello, my name is Isabel Richards. I'm the Heritage Engagement Officer on the Pilgrim Roots Project, which is based uh, in the Pilgrim's Gallery at Bassett Law Museum and across North Nottinghamshire. I've also been the Project Manager of the Wampanoag Perspectives Project uh, over the last year or so. So I'm the uh, architect of today's event, which I really hope you've enjoyed. I'm in the unenviable position of following lots of really eloquent people um, to try and wrap this up. But I do have the great privilege of saying thank you to everyone who's contributed today. So thank you all for participating. And thank you to Arts Council England for generously funding the project which made the cultural exchange visit in September, which saw amazing engagement with schools and the public, um, plus the building of the We Too at Bassett Museum possible, um, as well as this wonderful event today. I'd like to say thank you to Nottinghamshire County Council and Bassett Law District Councils um, and their staff for the partnership funding and the working across teams which we've seen to make all this possible. And um, especially I'd like to thank our contributors today, our keynote speakers and our breakout session leaders for really bringing our core themes of acceptance, migration and freedom to life. Um, This event has really been, for me, about making our shared history relevant today, as well as highlighting um, issues that are ongoing and encouraging compassion and sharing more accurately some of the stories of the past that um, have been oversimplified or just told wrongly. Uh, It's something I've been really proud of striving for over all this time. so next steps for you all there's um we've run out of time for the networking hopefully you've made some good connections today um before i let you go i know we've um, almost run out of time i just wanted to highlight some upcoming opportunities so first of all please do keep in touch i will post the project contact details in the group chat before you go um please invite us to your events uh, we'll be very glad to support you in return and we thank you for being here today Um, If you've been busy this afternoon and missed something on the agenda or been really torn about which breakout sessions to go to, I believe we successfully recorded many of the key events from today. So we'll be hosting those on the Bassett Law Museum and Pilgrims Gallery YouTube channel once they've been processed so you can catch up there. Tomorrow I'll be sending out an email to everyone who's um, taken part today with a survey about the event please do take five minutes to fill that out for us. It's going to help us learn as organisations, but also helps the heritage and cultural sectors learn um, when we report back to our funders. It will also help us justify running events like this again in future. And if you've, um, finally, if you ever find yourself in Nottinghamshire, please do come and see us at Bassetlaw Museum in Retford. Um, We've now got the very impressive We Too, which we understand is the only one in Europe, and the Pilgrim's Gallery, where we share those themes of acceptance and migration and freedom in the area that the Pilgrim leaders escaped from all those years ago. So thank you for being here. I hope you've had an enjoyable experience 
but also that you've taken something valuable away today as well. Thank you. Thank you.